shadows from the night sky. To understand this tragic death, police must follow a winding trail of clues. They struggle to learn whether it was merely an accident or something far more sinister. Each menacing clue heightens the mystery as police seek to uncover the identity of a man who kept dangerous company. Don't! Tennessee, Sam Reed and his daughter went about their morning routine. Hello? Nothing seemed yeah. out of the ordinary until Sam's daughter headed outside for the morning paper. Dad? A man was sprawled on their driveway. Dad? daughter called 911. Knox County 911. Knoxville Police Lieutenant Jerry Day was alerted. The dispatcher called us and said we have a, a dead body and has a parachute attached to it and it appears this individual has died from a fall. Car 32, take a 1091 at 19210 Pin Oak Circle, possible 32104 around the hall suspicious. The man must have fallen in the middle of the night. It appeared he had been dead for some time. His primary chute had not deployed, although his hand clutched the ripcord. It appeared the emergency chute opened on its own. We have someone who is uh, skydiving in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, which is very unusual. If you do have skydivers, they're usually out uh, in open areas in uh, daylight time. So we knew immediately that we had something that was going to be very unique. Nothing about the situation was what the officers expected, including the condition of the body. What we were expecting was to find uh, an individual who had massive wounds from impacting the ground. What we found was what appeared to be very minor superficial injuries. We weren't sure uh, why it was such a small amount of injuries in this individual. The officers expected to see a much greater amount of blood. His wounds didn't seem consistent with a violent fall to the ground. There was a cut underneath the chin, the uh, mouth was bleeding, the nose had been bleeding, and the teeth were uh, rearranged as if uh, the, the jaw had been impacted with something very hard. 
but uh, beyond that there were no other uh, outside physical injuries. The officers suspected the victim wasn't from Knoxville. He was wearing very expensive jump clothing. Uh, it appeared to be um, things that we would say were high dollar, which you don't normally find on most uh, area skydivers. He was carrying several thousand dollars in cash. We started looking for ID. We found his wallet, and inside the wallet we found a driver's license uh, to an Andrew Thornton out of Kentucky, but only to find behind that uh, another Kentucky driver's license with his picture, but with another name. The other name was Andrew Bourbon. Officers had no way of knowing which name, if either, was real. But it was the next discovery that stunned Knoxville police. Inside a large black duffel bag strapped to the victim, investigators found small parcels, each containing what appeared to be a kilo of unprocessed cocaine. From the markings on the drugs, investigators deduced they were packaged outside the U.S. Neighbors were drawn to the scene, but couldn't give the officers any information. No one had seen or heard anything suspicious that morning or the night before. The officers took the evidence found on the body back to headquarters to examine it. They were looking for additional clues to the parachutist's identity. The man was carrying various handguns. And we start through the backpack to find a fully loaded semi-automatic 9mm plus the Derringer, which is the type of a weapon that's going to be used by someone who is either working in a, a deep cover operation or uh, is, a, is a survivalist, someone who's going to have a backup weapon, which a lot of police officers carry. The guns were sent to the lab for testing. A pair of night vision goggles were even more puzzling. They were only available to the military. There was no serial number to use to trace the goggles' origin. He had all kinds of evidence to show that this was a really bad actor, someone who meant to survive whatever situation he found himself in. A notebook contained names and odd groupings of numbers. It appeared to be some kind of numeric code, though Detective Day was unsure of its meaning. Inside the bag, investigators also found South African gold Krugerrands. That's an expensive membership. They suspected the man carried gold so he could flee to another country and easily convert the untraceable Krugerrands to local currency. Most disturbing to the officers, however, was the discovery of Teflon-coated bullets. Teflon-coated. Ammunition that is Teflon-coated and is only used to penetrate body armor, which normally is worn by law enforcement officers. These bullets are, are normally called cop killers and individuals who uh, are uh, dead set on not being captured will use that type of ammunition. Detectives scrutinized the two Kentucky licenses. They placed calls to authorities there to determine if either was legitimate. There was no idea by anyone in the uh, investigative area as to who he really was. Once we found the uh, passport, driver's license. Uh, we started trying to pull uh, everything together to make a positive identification. Right on top of the driver's license. They also found a membership card to an exclusive resort in Miami. In the dead man's pocket, investigators found a key with some strange numbers on it. I've never seen one like that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an end number to, uh, that's a tail number off of an aircraft. That's an aircraft key. Huh. Detectives weighed the stash of cocaine. We don't normally come in contact with 34 kilos of coke. 
uh, over 80 pounds at uh, one time. Occasionally, we would get uh, involved with cases with pounds, but uh, nothing of this magnitude. The street value of the cocaine was almost $20 million. Too much for a small police department to protect. Fearing their precinct could be targeted by criminals desperate to get their hands on that much cocaine, they called for help. We contacted the Drug Enforcement Administration and told them what we had. Uh, we um, told them we had a large quantity of over uh, 70 pounds of cocaine and that we didn't want to keep it in our facility. The DEA had a vault that could secure it. The victim's main parachute hadn't been deployed, but his backup chute was open. Forensic technicians examined the dead man's equipment. They were looking for signs of sabotage. But the equipment appeared to be in perfect working order. It was unclear why the victim's primary chute hadn't deployed. He appeared to be an individual who knew exactly what he was doing, uh, which made the, the parachute accident uh, seem a, a somewhat strange to us. The officers would have to rely on other evidence to determine how and why the man died. Technicians examined the gun, but found no fingerprints, and gunmetal residue tests came back negative. It had not been fired recently. The county medical examiner began conducting an autopsy later that day. He hoped to find tattoos or other identifying marks. There were none. The medical examiner did find various injuries on the man's body that did not make sense. Bruises and contusions appeared inconsistent with a fall to the ground. They uh, could find no external injuries or uh, no bullet wounds or stab wounds or anything of that nature. And it appeared the man had been dead for several hours, perhaps even before he struck the ground. According to the preliminary autopsy report, something or someone had hit this man before his fall or in midair. It was looking less and less like an accident and more like murder. I was always... Dot com. While investigators grappled with the puzzling clues, the remarkable tale quickly became the media's lead story in Knoxville and across the South. A man was found dead in the driveway in Knoxville. Police are still investigating the circumstances surrounding this bizarre death. Officials ask that anyone with any information about the incident please contact the Knoxville police. We hadn't rolled him over yet. The publicity paid off. A ranger with the U.S. Forest Service in Georgia made a puzzling discovery. A black duffel bag, identical to the ones found near the parachute victim, was snagged in a tree. Another one lay on the ground. The bags contained another 150 kilos of cocaine. Several more duffel bags were found strewn in the Chattahoochee National Forest and in Cherokee County, Georgia, just south of Knoxville. From the location of the drop sites and the amount of cocaine, authorities speculated the drugs had come from somewhere south of the U.S., perhaps Central or South America. Media coverage of the event led investigators to their next big lead. Back in Tennessee, an employee at a small Knoxville airport contacted authorities. He'd seen the news and had found something he thought was perhaps linked to their case. One of the uh, maintenance men from the airport had discovered uh, a parachute and a reserve chute and a, uh, a green jumpsuit. The gear had been hidden behind a building. 
Investigators suspected the gear could have belonged to a second parachutist. Yes, it is. I didn't. I just found it. He probably survived the jump and hid the chute before he made his getaway. Lieutenant Day? The detectives soon received yet another call, this time from officials in North Carolina. The drug enforcement uh, investigators uh, called and stated that uh, the remains of a plane had been recovered uh, on North Carolina and that it might be associated with the parachutists that uh, had uh, landed in Knoxville. Clay County, North Carolina lay due east of Knoxville. Detective Day had no idea what he might find at the crash site. They hoped that somewhere in the twisted wreckage lay the clue to the identity of the mysterious dead man. They got a break when a fisherman in North Carolina contacted the local sheriff to report a plane crash. The accident occurred on September 11th at around 1 a.m. A local fisherman who was night fishing on a lake near the Cherokee National Forest uh, heard a low-flying aircraft approaching his location, and then it flew over him, uh, which kept his attention. And then the next thing he notices is the flames from the impact of the aircraft hitting the mountain. It took five hours for Detective Day and federal agents to hike to the crash site. It was a very devastating crash site. Uh, you had trees which had been sheared off three, four feet above the ground, and there were probably five to ten of those, uh, which told me that there was a major impact. When we, when we got to the aircraft, uh, one of the main things we were looking for was if there were any other bodies. The plane was destroyed, but didn't have much burn damage. Apparently, there had been little fuel left when it crashed. There was no luggage, no flight documents, and no bodies. There were even few seats. Most had been ripped out, leaving the cabin hollow, a standard procedure in drug runs. The end number on the aircraft matched the end number on the key that we found on the body in Knoxville. That was the connection for us between this aircraft and our skydiver. Like the odd clues found on the body in Knoxville, the plane crash didn't seem logical. Of course, we had no other bodies, uh, no other drugs within the aircraft. Uh, we were still very perplexed on uh, why he was jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft and putting it on automatic pilot, which was very evident from the uh, wreckage and the levers and things in the wreckage. The trip to North Carolina left authorities with even more questions. But the biggest question was finally about to be answered. Word had come from Lexington, Kentucky on the identity of the dead man. One of the man's IDs was a fake, the other legitimate. Fingerprints confirmed it. Their victim's name was Andrew Carter Thornton II. He was a former Lexington police officer and was known to Kentucky State Police Detective Don Powers. When I first met Drew Thornton, um, I was impressed that he was a, a go-getter, hard worker, um, a good officer. Years earlier, Drew had been a member of the police department's first narcotics squad. The squad found early success cleaning up Lexington streets, but they soon began to gather some unwanted attention. Their drug busts had become marred by a string of complaints from defendants about their treatment at the hands of the police. I was aware in the mid-70s uh, of certain problems that uh, were occurring within the Lexington Police Department. There had began to be all kinds of rumors about how their drug unit was operating, some of the strong arm tactics. 
growing allegations against the narc squad also attracted the attention of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Huggins. They were kind of a, a, a rogue group that pretty much skirted the law and uh, did a lot of questionable things in, uh, in enforcing drug laws around the University of Kentucky campus and the Lexington community. Uh, they were allegedly involved in planting drugs on suspects, uh, stealing drugs out of evidence lockers and, and reselling them and, and this sort of activity. Thornton and his crew were moved to other positions. The FBI learned it came too late. Drew Thornton and his friends had made many contacts within the drug world. The more we got into it, the more people started to surface, and then it was almost like a, a web. It started expanding out into different crimes, different people, different states, different countries. The Kentucky State Police and the FBI opened investigations into the activities of Drew Thornton. They learned he had partnered with a friend of his, Frank Barkley, and opened a security business. Barkley was a, another Drew Thornton type guy, very smart, very impressive, and un, if these guys, Thornton and uh, Barkley, had put all those talents to good use, there's no telling what they could have done, but unfortunately they decided to go the other way. The men ran with a rich crowd. Wherever Drew and Frank were, money was always being thrown around. The word on the street was their security business was an alleged front for the sale and distribution of marijuana. We were mainly gathering intelligence reports and formulating a plan and trying to somehow verify some of these allegations. Barkley was the money man. The two were known simply as the company. Drew Thornton handled the supply side, acquiring weapons, vehicles, and drugs. The duo had a reputation of doing anything for a buck. I think that Thornton prided himself on living on the edge, on being a soldier of fortune type person, on uh, being almost invincible that he could do anything. Serial number one, nine, because of his dangerous lifestyle, Lieutenant Jerry Day and the Knoxville police were beginning to suspect that their skydiver had not died from a mere accident. Watch it. 48 hours after the skydiving death of ex-cop Drew Thornton, the FBI took over the case. Newspapers shouted the mysterious details of his death, and Kentucky residents were shocked. Lexington Herald reporter Valerie Honeycutt. He came from a very well-respected family, and uh, there was a lot of people in Lexington who just had a hard time believing that he was involved in um, drug smuggling. Lexington, Kentucky is surrounded by beautiful country and lavish horse farms where some of the world's best thoroughbreds are raised. Drew Thornton was well known to the region's wealthiest families. The day after Drew's death, federal agents armed with a search warrant entered the exclusive Lexington home where Thornton lived. At the scene of his death, Agents had been left some enticing clues, cocaine, guns, and ammunition, and the parachute of an unknown accomplice who had escaped. They hoped that somewhere on his property, they would find a clue to explain the bizarre circumstances surrounding his death and lead them to his accomplice. But a search of Thornton's house turned up no new evidence. FBI Special Agent Jim Huggins. Someone had already been there and uh, taken whatever incriminating information there might have been. Investigators turned to Thornton's former employer for help. Lexington Police Detective John Bizak. 
and we were asked if there were people who could identify not only his body but certain things that uh, they'd found on his person. We recognized telephone numbers and names in the address book. Uh, we, of course, there were several names and telephone numbers which we were familiar with. One of the names in the phone book was Wes Trotter. He was a close friend of Thornton's, and both men had been questioned in an unsolved missing persons case years earlier. Socialite Amanda Finley left her parents' home on January 25th, 1977, for a routine appointment. Uh, about 5.15 in the afternoon, she turned left, traveled south uh, in her car, heading to a doctor's appointment, and was never seen again. She had talked to her father earlier in the afternoon and said that she would be home for supper. Her parents called police after not hearing from Amanda in four days. The Finleys told police it wasn't unusual for their daughter to take off. But she would always call. When her boss confirmed she hadn't shown up for work, the family knew something was wrong. A week after her disappearance, Amanda's car was found abandoned in a local parking lot. The storekeeper said the car had been parked there for several days. Her coat uh, and other belongings were found in the vehicle, but her car keys and her purse were gone. Forensic evidence technicians combed her car, looking for fingerprints, blood, or any signs of foul play. They found nothing. Months passed, and the Finley case turned cold. The press, however, did not forget her. Reporter Valerie Honeycutt. Amanda Finley was a beautiful young woman uh, from a, a well-known family. What police knew from the onset was that she had had some connection to Drew Thornton and Wes Trotter. Exactly what that connection was has never really been clear. Amanda had been dating Wes Trotter, a member of Lexington's narcotics squad, at the time of her disappearance. Her parents feared he knew something about their daughter's whereabouts. Trotter and Thornton were interviewed very early in the investigation about their knowledge of um, Finley and what information they had as to when they saw her last. Trotter claimed that he used her as an informant on drug investigations uh, off and on, but other than that, had no relationship with her. He also claimed he hadn't seen her for weeks. There were allegations that came from personal friends of Finley that she had told them she was involved in, with Trotter. But Thornton claimed he only knew Finley through Trotter and had no idea where she might be. Then, Detective Bizak got a lead on the missing girl. We had telephone records uh, from Finley that showed she had placed some calls to Florida prior to her disappearance. We also had information that a person who appeared to be her had been sighted in Daytona Beach, Florida. That was certainly enough to warrant um, a trip to Florida to determine if there could be any other uh, eyewitnesses or any evidence that she was in fact there. The phone calls had come from a restaurant. Yes, recognize this girl. There, Detective Bizak met witnesses who identified Amanda from photos. Lexington police believed their victim was, in fact, a runaway. More than six months after Amanda Finley vanished, a man came upon an unusual find that made detectives question their conclusion. A purse floating near the banks of the Kentucky River. By analyzing the contents, the purse was identified as Amanda Finley's. Fearing the missing person's case could possibly be a homicide investigation, the river was dragged. 
The dock lay just a short distance from Drew Thornton's property, 70 acres of land he co-owned with Wes Trotter. Kentucky State Police Lieutenant Don Powers. As a result of that purse being found, we then did become involved in some aspects of that investigation in so much as trying to, uh, to see if we could locate Amanda. It seemed that Drew Thornton was constantly surrounded by mystery and possibly murder. The list of those who could have wanted Drew killed was growing. While police were still trying to determine what caused his death, Drew Thornton was buried in a Lexington, Kentucky cemetery. Drew's body was found with nearly 80 pounds of cocaine strapped to it. The FBI was trying to find out where he got the drugs. His funeral drew dozens of Lexington's elite, politicians, police officers, and local aristocrats. Investigators kept a close watch on all his associates. They hoped one of them held the key to the mystery. Many of Drew's friends couldn't accept the rumors generated by his death. Reporter Valerie Honeycutt. There was a great deal of mystery uh, surrounding Drew Thornton's death. There was a lot of people in Lexington who just had a hard time believing that he was involved in um, drug smuggling. But the FBI knew differently. They had been watching Drew's friends very closely. Agent Jim Huggins. Well, this group is kind of unique uh, from other drug organizations because of their social status in the Lexington community. and. Uh, a lot of people in high places uh, gave them some uh, aura of respectability, which they certainly shouldn't be entitled to, but they were. Thornton, along with his friend Frank Barkley, ran a business they called The Company. The FBI believed it was a front for a drug smuggling operation. The men had connections in Las Vegas with a notorious pair of drug smugglers. Jimmy and Lee Chabra were believed to be two of the biggest and most dangerous drug traffickers in the country. The Shaggers are extremely uh, fearless and, and desperate individuals, and uh, they were uh, heavily involved in some serious drug smuggling. Lee nicknamed Effley in his hometown of El Paso, was an infamous Texas attorney known for his successful defense of drug dealers. His brother Jimmy was also well known to law enforcement. Currently out on bail, he was waiting to stand trial for drug trafficking. There was a pretty intense investigation going on in Las Vegas from the U.S. Attorney's Office and DEA into their activities. Oh, really? The Chagra brothers made millions running drugs from the largest suppliers of Colombia's infamous Medellin cartel. The company wanted a piece of their action. <laughs> Barkley was the one that ingratiated himself with the Chagra organization and uh, had a lot of connections with people in Las Vegas. The feds had never been able to successfully try the Chagra brothers, despite their reputed ties to the mob, Mideast terrorists, and Colombian drug lords. There were separate operations, the, uh, the Chagra's operation and the company's operation, and uh, they, it's kind of like a merger. Uh, Barclay took all his assets and teamed up with Chagra, and then they really became uh, involved in some big-time smuggling. It appeared to investigators the heads of the company were stepping up to the big time. Federal Prosecutor Brian Layton. Barkley wanted the high life in the biggest way, the quickest way to get to the high life is to run drugs. Agents began hearing from informants that Frank and Drew were going to start running drugs for the Chagras, and they were looking to expand their gang. 
They began scouring small and rural airports for pilots who could meet their criteria. Uh, what are you certified to fly? They had to be good pilots. They had to be able to fly without lights, um, without instruments, um, land, get off the plane, take off, and allow somebody else to um, to unload the dope, and then they would later get paid. A little bit of risk, a lot of reward, and uh, they will fix it. I think most of the people that got involved in this, they got involved for the thrill of it. It's thrilling. You go out and buy airplanes, you smuggle dope, you know, you toss that airplane, go buy another one. The men developed a routine for their drug smuggling operation. All right, count it. They felt it was a sure way to stay ahead of the police. Check out the title. If you have any questions, let me know. The team would buy used aircraft for cash. Is accurate down here? They would equip them with uh, extra large gas tanks. Uh, they'd take the seats out so they could carry large loads and started flying uh, to South America and back and forth and uh, recruiting pilots, uh, bodyguards, uh, and it was a very sophisticated uh, drug smuggling operation. By the late 1970s, the company's drug running operations were in full swing. With each run, they got better and were able to smuggle larger and larger amounts of contraband. For Barkley, this meant more money and more power. Drew and Frank wasted no time in using the Chagra's connections. They began buying as many drugs as they could afford in Colombia and shipping them to the U.S. When they landed in the U.S., unloading was done in record time by trained ground crews. They knew any delays could mean getting arrested within minutes. We began to uh, have some airplanes that were abandoned at various airports that were searched and had marijuana residue, and, and we began to get information that Thornton was involved in these. On one occasion, they landed at a small Lexington airport with a massive 20,000 pounds of illegal cargo. Authorities found the planes afterward, empty and scrubbed clean with disinfectant, but had never caught the men in the act. In one of the planes, the occupants had left behind a clue, a magazine addressed to Mr. Andrew Thornton. In my view, that was the first clue to a lot of people here in central Kentucky that some of their local sons were involved in um, a major a drug running, smuggling operation. It seemed there was no limit to what the company and the Chagras could achieve. But only a few months after the two groups teamed up, tragedy struck. Police in El Paso, Texas got a report that Lee Chagra was found shot to death in his office. Jimmy called Barkley for help. Unsure who had executed his brother and fearing for his own life, Chagra had nowhere else to turn. Jimmy Chagra needed protection. First thing in the morning. He called in a favor from Frank Barkley. He asked the company to protect him. I'm going to need three plane tickets to Las Vegas. Wes, me, and Drew. Seeing this as a possible opening to move in on the Chagra's empire, Frank agreed. You're not going to Vegas without a plan. What are you doing? He started making plans to beef up security in Chagra's Las Vegas home. Drew, however, was wary. All I'm asking for is a couple of hours. Working this closely with the Chagras meant more power and more risk. Wait a minute, come on! Any shakeup in the Chagra Empire would inevitably cause trouble for the company. You're smarter than this. Don't do this. Come on! Frank was determined not to let Jimmy Chagra down. But Jimmy was in trouble. He was arrested in San Antonio, Texas, charged with importing marijuana and cocaine from Colombia. The prosecution had been gearing up for this case for months. 
Judge, we're here to request a reduction bail. Bail was set at one million dollars, an amount Chagra's attorney argued was excessive. My client, first of all, has no prior record, no previous. U.S. District Judge Robert Drews agreed with the defense and lowered the bail. Your Honor, there's plenty of reasons. He vowed that if Chagra was convicted, he would not get off easy. Jimmy had a long run just out of reach of the law. But this judge was known for being tough on drug dealers. We have plenty of heard of him. Judge, who was trying the Chagra's case, was known throughout that area as an extremely harsh judge in drug cases. Your Honor, the meeting's over. At this time, the ties that bound Jimmy Chagra and the company were tighter than ever before. They were extremely fearless and desperate individuals, and they were heavily involved in some serious drug smuggling. And they saw, I think, their empire getting ready to come down. May 29th, 1979. It was the first day of Jimmy Chagra's trial, and Judge Drews had no idea what awaited him when he stepped from his home that morning. His wife heard the shot, but did not see the sniper. Paramedics responded quickly to the scene. The judge had lost a considerable amount of blood. It would be a race against time to save him. A new escape. On May 29th, 1979, Judge Drews was walking out of his house when he was shot. Paramedics arrived within minutes and were now working to save his life. It was a losing battle. The judge had lost a lot of blood. Despite all their efforts, they couldn't save him. Judge Drews was pronounced dead on arrival. News of the assassination of a federal judge reverberated in FBI offices across the US, including Lexington. FBI agent Jim Huggins. It just shows how dangerous these individuals were, and that they would stop at nothing to keep their operation going. The sniper was captured and prosecuted, and Jimmy Chagra was convicted of drug charges, but escaped the country before he was sentenced. Although the FBI suspected the company might somehow be involved, they, like the Texas police, had no proof. They maintained surveillance on members of the company, but they found nothing to incriminate them. With the Chagras out of the way, the company showed no signs of slowing their business dealings. They were looking to intensify their drug runs to Columbia. Pressure from investigators concerned Barkley. He brought in a new member to the gang to help solve his problem. Mike Kelly was a licensed gun dealer in Lexington. Federal agents suspected he was the alleged go-to man for anyone looking for illegal weapons. Mike Kelly was an electronics expert, had a small company in Lexington that supplied radios, alarms, and this kind of equipment. According to federal surveillance reports, Kelly was in contact with Frank Barkley and Drew Thornton on a frequent basis. We had heard some rumors that they were getting ready to do a big drug deal, but we had no specifics. The company was so effective at moving in the shadows that law enforcement seemed powerless to bring their illegal dealings into the light. Investigators continued pressuring anyone who was associated with the company, and some of them started to talk. Danny Yates had been hired by Barkley as a pilot. 
What was it exactly that you did steal? He was implicated on smuggling charges and was issued an ultimatum by prosecutor Brian Layton. That's it. Cooperate or go to prison for a long time. None of these people had ever been in prison before and they didn't like the prospects of it. We needed their cooperation to go after Barclay and some of the big boys. Um, and so we struck deals. In exchange for immunity, Yates confirmed the company was looking to increase their drug running activity. Yates said that Columbia had become a regular destination for Frank Barkley and his business associates. The death of Lee Chagra had left a void that Barkley was only too willing to fill. Barkley had long had his eye on the Chagra's drug empire. Yates told investigators Barkley was particularly seduced by this new world. Seemed a prime business opportunity. He's gonna stay right here with me. Combining right assets with, with the Chagras had no. given them access to aircraft brokers Stop. and weapons experts. Sorry about that. And working directly with Columbia's top suppliers meant they no longer had to deal with the middleman. But Frank Barkley had a problem. He needed to come up with the cash to buy the drugs, and he didn't have any. But Barkley was ruthless in running his drug business. Tom Burke, one of the men accompanying Barkley, would learn that the hard way. Frank decided to leave Burke behind. That person was left with the Colombians as collateral for payment for the dope, because Barclay would not pay for the dope up front, the Colombians didn't trust him, uh, and they said, well, if uh, you don't pay us within so many days, this guy dies. So they kept him captive down in, in Colombia until the dope got into the, into the country and Barclay paid for it. For Barclay, it was a small price to pay to keep his drug lord satisfied. He was looking to make money, no matter who got hurt. He had to find a better way to pay for the drugs. Barkley came up with another plan. Investigators learned he found a source of drug money thousands of miles away at a naval station in California. A man taking inventory of specialized radio and guidance equipment noticed that some items were missing. When the man called his supervisor, they checked the requisition orders and couldn't find any record that the items had been removed. Thursday the 26th. The man's supervisor contacted the FBI. Special Agent Mike Devitt. I was notified by the Naval Investigative Service agent at the base that uh, a, an individual there had apparently requisitioned some uh, equipment that he apparently had no need for. And uh, that when they confronted him, uh, he had some very elusive answers as to what happened to the equipment. Yeah. They questioned the man who had taken the goods. He told them two men approached him and asked him to help them obtain some radar and guidance devices. We interviewed uh, this individual. He was pretty vague at, uh, initially as to what it was used for because he had been told by the two individuals that had approached him in order to obtain this information to just be on the lookout for certain types of equipment. John Barclay. The man went on to say that he had several meetings with John Barclay. His name was familiar to investigators. He was Frank Barkley's cousin. Agents set their sights on John Barkley. They pressured his suspected accomplice. He basically realized we had him in a, in a pretty hard spot. We obtained uh, permission from the United States Attorney's Office to actually uh, tape record his phone calls. Their witness got in touch with John Barkley. Hello? It's Brandon. 
But as federal authorities listened to his phone conversations, it became clear that John wasn't the brains of the operation. It appeared Frank Barkley was in charge. Barkley was in charge. There wasn't any question about that. Okay. Agents set up surveillance at John Barkley's home. We conducted surveillance. We'd seen him move in some of this equipment. We knew for a fact we had him cold on the, th on the theft of the government property. In the fall of 1979, John Barkley was seen in possession of the stolen military equipment. But the FBI didn't arrest him. They continued to watch John Barkley, hoping he would implicate his cousin in the thefts. From talking with informants, investigators pieced together Barkley's plan to take the equipment. He was an electronics technician who worked for the U.S. Air Force. Because of his work on classified radar systems, John Barkley would have had security clearance. In the summer of 1979, with the aid of insiders on the base, he asked his friend to help him steal 10 sets of starlight night vision goggles and a variety of technical equipment which could be used to outfit small planes to avoid detection. They had some instruments installed in some of the planes so they could pick up when radar beams were being directed their way so that they could drop or do whatever they had to take a, a action. Barkley must have counted on the fact that the equipment was older, ignored, and the checkpoint guards only stopped vehicles on their way in, not on their way out. He thought this equipment would never be missed. He was wrong. Investigators had recovered most of the stolen equipment, but three sets of the night vision goggles were still missing. Federal prosecutor Brian Layton had a theory on where the missing equipment might have gone. Barclay thought it was a very good idea if he could get military equipment uh, because he found that it was cheaper to steal military equipment and trade it to the Colombians um, for drugs than it is to pay him cash. It was the strategy of a consummate businessman. Lower costs and up the profit margin. Okay, you can use that? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Colombians have a lot of money. They like gadgets, and so they just love these little gadgets. Layton knew the company was still in action, and he was determined to bring them down. We knew we had a huge operation on our hand, a very well-organized operation on our hand, a bunch of dangerous people. FBI Special Agent Mike Devitt. He started tying it together, building upon what we had developed initially, and now all of it was mushrooming into a full-blown narcotics investigation. How old are you? 32. Yates went on to tell them that with the arms coming in from China Lake, Barkley could finally get his man out of Columbia. How old are you? 32. He hatched a plan that would serve two purposes. Barkley was angry with an associate named Ray Deming. He asked him to join Yates in a quick run to Columbia. Barkley told Deming he had to leave a man behind on his last run and hope to win his freedom with an extra shipment of arms. Within minutes, Yates fired up the engine. And the plane was headed down the runway. They flew south-southeast over the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, headed for the northern coast of Colombia. Deming soon learned Great. this was not a typical trip. You know what we're doing up here? Yates had a confession to make. Uh, wish I knew. Wish I knew. His marching orders were, at the time that the uh, trip was initiated, were that uh, when he got over the uh, Caribbean, he was to uh, put the plane on automatic pilot and throw Ray Deming out the door. He threw the plane into a dive. The Caribbean Sea rushed closer and closer. It was a controlled uh, ditching. As it turned out, uh, Danny Yates was a very accomplished pilot. He just put it down in the waves. 
Yates knew there was an unspoken code among drug smugglers. An uncompleted mission will be forgiven if you have to ditch your plane, either by accident or to avoid capture by police. What problems did you have? I always shot the runway. I was supposed to be Danny Yates. Uh, that was the first time that he really realized uh, what he was into. He, uh, he was just a good old country boy and there wasn't any way he was going to get involved in a murder. And that's where one of our night vision devices got away from him as a result of that crash. And they had done this just to, uh, to throw off um, Barkley. The plan seemed to work. The Colombians were satisfied. Burke was released. And Deming was alive. Gates went on to tell investigators that on returning to the U.S., the three went into hiding. Yates also told them that tensions among members of the company were running high. The company was in danger of pulling apart. Investigators hoped these tensions would prompt the men to make a mistake that would lead to their capture. On September 10, 1985, a low-flying plane raced across the night sky. Inside, two men put on skydiving gear. They put the plane on automatic pilot. When everything was ready, they jumped into the night. The next morning, one of the parachutists was found dead on a driveway in Knoxville, Tennessee. On his body, police found over $20 million worth of cocaine. After Drew's death, agents were scrambling to try and uncover what may have happened to him and if anyone would have wanted him dead. Investigators looked into a piece of rural, wooded property he owned called Triad. Lexington Police Detective John Bizak. This property was down on the Kentucky River, uh, and it uh, was alleged to belong to uh, Trotter. Uh, Thornton and some other folks. There were accusations that there was um, a soldier of fortune type training going on at that facility. Neighbors in the area reported sighting strange men in camouflage gear and hearing the sound of gunshots. Don Powers of the Kentucky State Police. The triad was somewhat always a mystery. We had information that uh, it was an encampment and a training ground probably for uh, terrorists or something of that nature. By 1980, the company was growing. As they got bigger, they needed more and more security. The group had become a strange meld of socialites and social misfits, including smugglers, gun runners, and mercenaries. Profits were at an all-time high, but tensions were splintering the group. Better I want to be alive. Lee's dead. Where next? Barclay's relentless pursuit of the Chagra Empire infuriated Thornton. To Barclay, his partner seemed short-sighted and disloyal. Don't you think after uh, how much we've made, the rest Word on the street was that their partnership finally cracked under the strain. You're doing it without thought. Thornton and Barclay severed their ties. Drew Thornton and Frank Barkley went from partners to competitors after they had a falling out and broke up their drug smuggling ring. In January 1980, ATF agents heard that Frank and his cousin John were staying at a hotel in Philadelphia. John was under investigation for stealing arms from the China Lake Naval Facility. ATF Special Agent Frank Eddy uh, they were, um, you know, tipping big, big tips to the maids. Uh, the maids were told at times to stay out of the rooms, not to make up the beds, not to do anything. Their behavior made the staff suspicious. Housekeeping! 
at certain times the maids did see uh, firearms, guns in the rooms. They notified the Philadelphia police. On January 4th, 1980, authorities raided the motel. They arrested John Buck, charging him with firearms violations. But detectives had been told two men occupied the room. John Barkley told the cops where to find his cousin. He wasn't far. At the time of the raid, Frank Barkley was at a local airport. Officials caught up with him minutes before he boarded his plane. He was found to be carrying semi-automatic weapons, commando daggers, several fraudulent IDs, and more than $22,000 in cash. The first that we really became involved in this was after they were arrested in Philadelphia. Uh, the Philadelphia police contacted Lexington police and ATF, you know, asking for information on who these guys are, what they're doing, you know, anything about them, they have criminal record. The Philadelphia authorities learned that John Barkley was under suspicion for the alleged theft of military hardware from a secret testing site in California. Turn to the right. The Philadelphia police found Frank Barkley had no arrest record or outstanding warrants. He seemed the picture of a typical upscale businessman. But federal authorities revealed that he too was being investigated for his role in the thefts and his links to drugs, guns, and organized crime. Philadelphia police soon recognized that they had inadvertently busted members of a large-scale weapons network. They uncovered a small cache of weapons, silencers, and telephone scramblers. When they raided the room, they found guns, uh, certain other uh, eavesdropping equipment. There was also a, some documents. One was a, a receipt for a storage facility uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, and of course that piqued everybody's interest. Agents had been tipped off that the door of the storage facility was booby-trapped. The door wasn't booby-trapped. We thought, well, you know, maybe something else is booby-trapped. I mean, here's all these weapons, there's boxes and cartons of ammunition and all kinds of stuff. So we had to be really careful about going through the individual uh, items about, you know, when does this blow up? I mean, is this going to blow up in your face or uh, uh, what's in this box? The assortment of weapons and military gear stunned the officers. Much of it consisted of items stolen from China Lake. The Starlight Night School, Soviet-made machine guns with anti-aircraft mounts, taser stun guns and anti-tank guns even semi-automatic M2 carbines. The arsenal was estimated to be worth a quarter of a million dollars. I was very much surprised to find some of the type of weapons that they had. Just isn't something that the average person is going to have in their gun collection, you know. This, of course, indicated to us that these people were involved in some other type of activity. We started uh, Tracing the guns, one of the weapons, a 22 caliber survival rifle, uh, was registered in the name of uh, Andrew Thornton and it had been purchased from a local gun dealer by the name of Mike Kelly. It seemed an open and shut case. Investigators hoped that legal pressure on Barkley would push him to testify against Thornton and other members of the company. But Frank Barkley, had other plans. The new escape. It seems certain Frank Barkley would go to jail. But as Lexington Herald reporter Valerie Honeycutt recalls, the citizens of Lexington did not all agree. 
We got letters to the editor from people, from from ministers, and from people saying that it just couldn't be true of these of these fine men, and that it was all uh, allegation, and we were just trying to sell papers by muddying these these folks' names. A lot a lot of community uh, outrage that we were that we were continuing to write about this. But it would be difficult to stop the members of the company. Both Frank and John Barkley were found not guilty. ATF agent Frank Eddy. See, when you uh, find uh, these type of devices, the machine guns with anti-aircraft mount, anti-tank guns, radar uh, jamming equipment, yeah, it makes you think, I mean, what, what uh, lawful purpose could these individuals have with that? There's no, no civilian uh, um, use for the, this type of weaponry. Despite their good fortune, members of the company could not exactly breathe easy. Ray, why don't you count the nice man's money? By 1981, the gang had splintered apart. Many were in hiding, were the targets of indictments from prosecutors in other states. Mike Kelly and his wife Bonnie had been close friends with Drew and Franks. Mike, who supplied the two with electronics and guns, soon found himself entangled in a Florida drug case. Agent Jim Huggins. Mike Kelly was employed by some drug smugglers in South Florida to supply electronic equipment to a boat they were equipping for a shipment of marijuana being smuggled into Punta Gorda. In the process of this operation, Mike went to Florida, and when he was down there, an informant blew the whistle on the whole operation, and he was arrested. Kelly denied any knowledge of the drug deal, but the ploy didn't work. He was found guilty of drug conspiracy charges. The first alleged member of the company was behind bars. Mike Kelly was arrested in, uh, in South Florida on the drug smuggling operation, and the, the prosecutor was uh, pressuring him very hard to get his cooperation. Uh, that sent shockwaves throughout the group in Lexington. Charlotte Harbor, Florida, January 16, 1982. Shortly before 7 p.m., the doorbell rang at the home of District Attorney Larry Noland. It happened in seconds. Larry Noland? Yes, how can I help you? Don't! D.A. Noland was shot in the heart at point-blank range. He was declared dead at the scene. Detectives knew the victim. Noland was a criminal prosecutor known to be tough on drug runners. He was the same prosecutor pressuring Mike Kelly to name his criminal associates. When the prosecutor was killed, uh, his wife had overheard some conversation indicating that possibly he knew who the person was. And then she heard the shots ring out. And uh, it was some indication that, that the killer was known to her husband. According to an autopsy report, the assailant had used wad cutter bullets. Most bullets have a rounded, rounded edge. These are flat with a hole in the center. And what it does when it enters the body, it rips and tears more than a, a, a straight bullet that would go straight through. It makes more, does more damage. Officers canvassed the quiet, affluent neighborhood. A witness recalled seeing a woman with blonde hair in a blue jogging suit. She'd gotten into a car. Based on witness descriptions, a composite sketch of the woman was developed. A rental car agent identified Bonnie Kelly, Mike Kelly's wife, from the composite sketch of the alleged shooter. No one was surprised among the Kentucky State Police. Well, it was everyone's suspicion that Bonnie killed the prosecutor. He had quite a reputation of being hard on drug 
people, uh, people involved in drug trafficking, and I guess they thought they would take a better, have a better chance with someone else. Things were really beginning to hop. Things were beginning to come together. Information was coming fast and furious, and the heat was on. The group, I'm sure, knew it. Bonnie, however, had a solid alibi. I have a few questions for you right quick. Harvey Walker, you know, close friend of Drew and Frank's, stepped forward, claiming that he and Bonnie had been in a business meeting on the night in question. They were stonewalled by Walker. He refused to talk to them. Uh, they didn't really have a, a lot of direct evidence. No one would cooperate. FBI agent Jim Huggins knew they needed someone on the inside with less allegiance to the group. Someone more easily manipulated than Harvey Walker and Drew Thornton. He set his sights on Bonnie's sister. She had lived with Mike and Bonnie Kelly off and on for years. I want you to tell me what your sister was doing. She was privy to their conversations and the activities of their friends. Fearing she would be indicted as an accomplice, she confessed what she knew to Agent Huggins. She told Huggins that after Mike's arrest, the group was nervous. They needed a plan. Harvey Walker was concerned that if Mike Kelly had uh, agreed to cooperate with the prosecutor, then all their activities, illegal activities they had been committing over the years would all become to the forefront and they'd all be in a lot of trouble. Shouldn't be a problem. The group had an idea. It was a chance for Bonnie Kelly to reveal her loyalty to the company. Bonnie's sister's information broke the case wide open. After the murder, Bonnie uh, returned to Fort Myers, checked in a motel with uh, Stephen Taylor and her getaway driver. And they called, made a phone call to her sister in Lexington. Bonnie told her sister to give Harvey Walker a message. It's been done. You trot her. In exchange for immunity, she agreed to testify against her sister at trial. But Mike Kelly's wife, Bonnie, wouldn't take the fall alone. Mike's wife had never been involved in a crime in her entire life. Harvey Walker had given her the weapon. Harvey Walker told her that uh, she should use wad cutter ammunition, and she and her sister went to a Kmart in Lexington and purchased a box of wad cutters. And he told her the reason for that, that it would do more damage and would, uh, be, would kill someone easier than a, a regular round. So what do you got? Agents broadened the net and began bringing in anyone they could find who was connected to the company. It was a lengthy investigation because of the number of places that we had to go to, the amount of confirmations that we had to do, the amount of grand jury subpoenas that had to go out. Uh, but the more things we corroborated, um, the more we said, geez, we got a tiger by the tail here. In January 1982, Assistant U.S. Attorney Brian Layton indicted Frank and John Barkley, Drew Thornton, Mike Kelly, and 21 other company members. The seven counts range from drug trafficking to stealing and receiving government property. Barkley was arrested outside Chicago. Frank Barkley was sentenced to 20 years for the China Lake case, as well as an additional four and a half years on out-of-state drug charges. 20 years was probably the maximum we could get, so it was a just sentence at the time. Um, did he deserve life? If there were any killings, yeah, he deserved life. We just could never pin any killings on him. Thornton was harder to catch. When news of the indictments broke, he fled. Charlie X Ray 7501 Alpha Niner, do you copy? Charlie X Ray 
intercepted a radio transmission from a plane bearing Thornton's call letters. Thornton logged a flight plan indicating he was headed to a North Carolina airport for repairs. Police were waiting for him when he landed. He was arrested and held on $1 million bail. When he was arraigned in court, he was extremely arrogant. It's like, oh, you have no case against me. Oh, this is BS. Because there was little evidence linking Thornton to the events at China Lake, Drew served only a few months for his part in the operation. He would be released in the fall of 1982 and promptly disappear. Slip away. At the time of his death, the DEA had an open case file on Thornton. It appeared that after the China Lake case had put many of his friends behind bars, he was now working alone. The DEA had followed him to Miami. Agents had been keeping a close watch on Drew Thornton. In August, Drew made contact with an aircraft broker named Levi Shulman. He was unaware the aircraft broker was also a DEA informant. DEA agent Kieran Cobell. Well, Levi Shulman was brokering aircraft to groups that he knew uh, were involved in transporting uh, cocaine uh, up from South America into South Florida. And he had a history with these people. Agent Kieran Cobell observed from a distance. There were meetings that were being conducted, and he would tell us about that. And we would cover those, so we would conduct surveillance of those meetings. Shulman was a career criminal and had been known to work deals on the side and pass bad information. I had been down that road with informants before, uh, and I knew the game that he was playing. Florida was a major port of entry for drugs. The DEA worked to stem the flow, but to do that, they had to know when the drugs were moving. I had every hope that we would know uh, when Thornton would be taking off. And Shulman knew that we wanted that information. Shulman had orchestrated hundreds, if not thousands, of deals like this before. But to Cobell, this seemed different. Shulman seemed genuinely fond of the stranger from Kentucky. I think he liked him, I think he trusted him, and I think the proof of that to me the, is the fact that Thornton actually stayed with Shulman in his uh, townhouse or his condominium at the jockey club. Because Shulman couldn't be trusted, Agent Cobell and his partner kept close tabs on Drew Thornton. But Cobell knew the former police officer might quickly pick up on surveillance. They needed to be careful. Thornton had pulled onto Miami's Palmetto Expressway headed north. Cobell and his partner split up. They kept in contact about Thornton's location via a DEA radio frequency. My partner and I were communicating on the radio right, that Thornton's headed to down to the next exit. Because somebody's in the lead and then somebody stays behind on surveillance. So it becomes pretty clear that as we're communicating, Thornton begins rubbernecking, more than just casual looking around. He's looking in the rearview mirror in, in the passenger's compartment. He's looking in the side rearview mirrors. He's, he's looking for something. It's almost like as we're talking, he's listening to us. Thornton gets off at the next exit. And I communicate with my partner. I said, I don't think he's made us, but he knows something's going on. Let's get off him. Agent Cobell's fears about tracking Thornton were justified. 
Shulman later told him Thornton had a scanner and had picked up Cobell's communications with his partner. Thornton disappeared that day. It's really much more difficult to conduct an investigation of people of that type because they know the, the logical investigative steps that you're going to undertake. The next time Agent Cobell heard about Drew Thornton, he was dead. Cobell was expecting his informant to tell him about Thornton's next drug run, but that information never came. Agent Cobell went to talk with Shulman to try and determine what had happened. Shulman admitted he'd provided Thornton with a plane for his last flight. The plan was to pick up some 800 pounds of cocaine in Colombia. So what can you tell me about Drew Thornton? The information was new to Agent Cobell. Well, I talked with him. Uh... Shulman had not given me the call uh, that I needed to have so that I could be on alert, so that I could alert customs. There's a, there's a whole team of law enforcement people who needed to be put on alert when, when an aircraft launches on a, on a smuggling trip like this one did. Cobell was furious his informant had held out on him. He says, well, I was contacted by so-and-so in Columbia, and I got to go up to Kentucky to find out what happened. And I said, and I'm going with you. And then he was, oh, no, you can't do that. And it's like, well, I'm not really asking you. The only logical plan was to go up to Kentucky and try and track down through different various points of contact up there um, who had the cocaine, where it was, and try and find out who else was involved. Agent Cobell headed to Kentucky to try and find the rest of Drew's stash of cocaine and possibly find his murderer. When Drew Thornton was found dead with millions of dollars worth of cocaine strapped to his body, DEA agent Kieran Cobell and his informant Levi Shulman went to find out who had the rest of the drugs. The two men started with the woman closest to Drew. Levi Shulman promised Cobell that he would lead him to Thornton's girlfriend, Rachel Gant. She had agreed to meet with him. Hey, Gant admitted being in a hotel the night that Thornton died, waiting for him. Waiting for Drew's call. Gant admitted that uh, Thornton had not showed up, but his accomplice on the aircraft had showed up, and they had Gant and the accomplice had waited until sometime early in the morning for Thornton to come. The reason we asked you down here, but Thornton never came. Now that Thornton was dead, Gant knew his drug business partners would come after her. The Colombians would be looking uh, for their cocaine, and so she knew that she was in a bit of a hard spot. Gant said that she was going to be going into hiding and that any further contact could be uh, made through the attorney. With that, Rachel Gant disappeared, and the rest of the drugs and the money were never recovered. The investigators brought together all the information they gathered on Drew Thornton and pieced together the events leading up to his final flight. On September 10, 1985, Drew Thornton and a co-pilot arrived in Columbia ready to pick up a substantial load, 800 pounds of cocaine, packed in a series of large black duffel bags. The deal was going down, but the DEA had no idea. Shulman had held out on them. Several hours into the flight, somewhere over the southern U.S., Drew noticed it, a plane in the distance. He was convinced. 
convinced they were being followed. Thornton ordered his pilot to lose the plane. But the aircraft in pursuit was larger, gaining fast. Closing in. Okay. Knoxville, Tennessee Police Detective Jerry Day. We surmise that uh, Andrew and uh, his accomplice uh, had uh, thought they had picked up an air tail either from the Drug Enforcement Administration, the FBI, or Customs. Uh, he had become very paranoid. We know that later on and through the investigation, he was a very paranoid individual. And he thought he was, probably thought he was being followed. For Thornton, there was no choice. Give me the headphones. Couldn't afford to be caught. He radioed Rachel, who was awaiting his arrival in Knoxville. Rachel, Rachel, can you copy? Rachel, Rachel, can you copy? Go for Rachel. When interviewed by the DEA, Rachel refused to identify Thornton's accomplice or divulge many details. We're going to have But she confirmed that Thornton sounded panicked. He spoke going of the chase plane. plane. What about our cargo? And the need to bail out. Then he signed off for the last time. Rachel Gant never gave investigators any more information. Rachel Gant was uh, very loyal, uh, protecting him right up to the end and uh, refused to testify for a grand jury in Knoxville, which resulted in her indictment. But to this day, I don't think she's ever betrayed his confidence. A uh, pretty hardcore individual, in my opinion. The men jumped at night, a dangerous prospect even for someone as seasoned as Thornton. Don't worry, you're going to be fine. According to Gant, the pilot had never jumped before. His was a leap of faith. But Thornton welcomed the danger. Some said he thought he was invincible. But Thornton was not invincible. In fact, none of the gang escaped capture or prosecution. They were a tight, close, uh, knit group of, of friends. And I think that they fed on each other's adventures and, and, and misdeeds. In fact, I think they kind of fed on each other's crimes. The fact that, uh, and that they were all connected with each other, that they were um, somehow involved in the assassinations of both a federal judge and a federal prosecutor, I think speaks volumes about the fact that they thought that they were um, untouchable. They thought that they were capable of doing anything and trying anything and getting away with anything, and they did. But when indictments and various trials were finally handed down, the company turned on its own, friend testifying against friend. Frank and John Barkley, Mike and Bonnie Kelly, and Harvey Walker were all found guilty on a variety of charges from murder to conspiracy. Only Mike Kelly's drug conviction was reversed on appeal. What happened to Drew Thornton, however, is still not entirely clear. The Knoxville, Tennessee medical examiner eventually declared his death an accident. The mysterious injuries most likely caused by a duffel bag battering him all the way down. Or he may have struck the wing of his own plane when he jumped. But how such an experienced jumper could make such a mistake is unclear. He impacted something as he was exiting the aircraft. The uh, wound to the bottom of his chin is, uh, made it very evident that something had impacted his head. Uh, what we surmised was that it rendered him unconscious uh, to the point that uh, uh, he was falling and then once he regained consciousness uh, he immediately pulled his emergency shoe because he wasn't sure how far from the ground he was. But it was too late. The emergency chute jerked Thornton onto his back. Everyone uh, that, that knew uh, Drew uh, liked him personally, but there was always this dark side. It was that dark side 
that drove Thornton into a world of crime, drugs, and guns. And it was that dark side that ultimately killed him.